When I was a seminarian, I was blessed to get to go to Rome and to get to see Pope Benedict during uh, liturgy. And as he processed forward through St. Peter's Basilica, starting at the back and going down the long aisle, he would, would walk forward a little bit and then he'd see this couple with a baby or, or see this older person and, and he might take the baby and, and bless the baby or kiss him and, and he might go and shake the hand of this older person. And, and then there was this, this big section of the seminarian sitting almost towards the, the front and we were all in our cassock and our surplus. And I was feeling pretty proud of myself thinking, you know what, the Pope sees, he, he sees me, I'm in my cassock. I'm I'm in my surplus. I'm studying to be a priest. He's going to get really excited to, to shake my hand. And I was right next to the rail, right next to the, the aisle. And, and, uh, and we were pushing in. And, and just as the Pope approached the section of seminarians, he stopped speaking to the crowd, turned and faced and went straight forward and finished the procession for the liturgy. The thing that I learned from that is that if I'm going to go to Rome and try to meet the Pope, then I should uh, borrow somebody's baby. Anyway, I was blessed um, during most of my time in seminary to have Pope Benedict as the Pope, and I really wanted to take a moment, uh, one, to honor him and to, to ask our parishes to pray for him, uh, and then to speak a little bit about how he impacted me and how that comes out in the decisions I make as pastor and in some of the ways that I preach. Pope Benedict uh, seemingly was a man of contradictions or, or paradoxes. Um, he led the reform of the church going into the Vatican, uh, into the Second Vatican Council, and, and he really desired um, a reform, especially in the liturgy. Um, but then later on as Pope, he also called the church to, to, be, to go back and to be rooted in some of the liturgical traditions. Uh, Pope Benedict was a man who talked about the encounter with Christ, the personal encounter with Christ, but he was also um, the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, and, and he held fast to uh, the doctrines of the church that the church had, had taught. Um, many have said that he is conservative, or many have said that um, he is uh, he, he's the, the Pope who is uh, God's Rottweiler or whatever. All of those words fall short in comparison to a man who was completely in love with Christ, completely in love with Christ's church, and who anybody who actually met him encountered a man who was incredibly gentle, incredibly humble, while at the same time very staggering in his intellect. One of the greatest things that Pope Benedict said, which has formed me as a priest, is that being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but an encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but it's an encounter with an event or a person that gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Pope Francis just recently said, and it was publicized all over the media, that, that the encounter with Christ, love of Christ, is more important than all of the commandments. Uh, these are the same things, it's just different ways of saying them. What Pope Benedict wants us to know is that our encounter with Jesus Christ comes first and foremost. And then all of the doctrines, all of the traditions, of the church, as beautiful as they are, those lend themselves to that relationship with Jesus. One of the most helpful things I learned about Pope Benedict is this phrase, the one subject church. What does that mean? That's kind of a strange phrase. It's a very theological phrase, uh, but it's actually really simple. So when we talk about a subject, we talk about uh, a person, a person who, who has their own experiences, their own knowledge, their own senses, their own memory and imagination. And Pope Benedict held that the church is a subject. That's why we refer to the church as she and not it many times. So the church is a she. She is the bride of Christ. The church was present during the life of Christ in the person of the apostles, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, of Mary Magdalene, of all the saints, and the church has been continually present, um, guarded, and, and united by the Holy Spirit from that moment. And so therefore the church guards this relationship of love, this, this memory, um, this, this, this desire to continue to go into a deeper relationship with Jesus. That's why when we say the creed, when we say, I believe, uh, yes, I'm speaking from the, the, the perspective of, of Father Tim, but at the same time, the I can also be seen as the I of the church, the church which existed 2,000 years ago and continues to exist because Jesus promised that it would continue to exist. So what does that tell us? It tells us that if I want to encounter the living God made flesh, if I truly want to be in communion with God who is love, with Jesus Christ, I have to do that in and through his church. 
And so what that teaches us is that all of the, the moral and ethical teachings of the church, even the most difficult, whether they have to do um, with, with human sexuality, whether they have to do with morality, whatever they have to do with, all of those are meant to help me maintain an ordered relationship with Jesus Christ himself. It also means that, that all of the traditions of the church, the liturgical traditions of the church, that, that the, the things of the past aren't bad, but what develops in a new and organic way also isn't bad. But it has to develop in a new and continuous organic way. It can't be this sense of rupture. So Pope Benedict was an expert at Vatican II, and he spoke a lot about the Second Vatican Council. Um, and it's really important um, for those who know Pope Benedict and, and, and want to learn more about him to really understand what the Second Vatican Council was about. Um, one of the things that it was about was about the holiness of the laity, of, of the ordinary people um, sitting in the pews, right? That it's not just priests and religious that are called to the life of perfection here and now, um, but it's the lay faithful. So that's why Pope Benedict uh, spoke about Lexio Divina and, and study of scripture, encountering Jesus in the scripture. That's why he wrote um, those volumes called Jesus of Nazareth. Um, but the other thing that, that the Second Vatican Council taught um, was and, and desired to, to have happen was a greater participation in the liturgy. Uh, what that meant was not necessarily that everybody's doing something, that this person's standing up and singing, or this person is, is, is the extraordinary minister or the lector. All of those are good, but what it meant is that the ordinary person in the pew is more engaged with their heart, their mind, their imagination, their, their, their feelings, their emotions, is more engaged with what's happening in the liturgy, because once again, what's happening in the liturgy, the Mass, is an encounter with Jesus himself, just as the apostles, just as the Blessed Virgin Mary encountered. And so we take that, that context, which has been developed over, over many, many, many decades and centuries, that context of the liturgy as we've inherited it. And so Pope Benedict, when he was Pope, he spoke about um, the hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is just how we, we view things, the hermeneutic of continuity. In other words, that what came before what continues to be and what comes after, all is meant to be in continuity. And as opposed to the hermeneutic of rupture, which is, okay, everything just kind of ruptures apart um, and breaks from the past. Many of you who were around after Vatican II saw um, that that happened in a lot of places. There was a great rupture, and that's not what the church desired, uh, that things just, just kind of just changed immediately and abruptly. Instead, there's meant to be this organic development. So what does that mean for me? Well, You'll hear me often preach about discipleship and evangelization. These are words that have great meaning that the church has been speaking about and that you've heard um, past pastors and priests speak about. Um, and, and speaking about an encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, um, those are all key realities. Um, but we'll also, at the same time, we'll hold fast, um, as we have been, we'll hold fast to the moral teachings of the church. So um, as I've said before, we're, we're not afraid to teach about um, the, the church's teaching, for example, on theology of the body and, and why it's not moral to, to use contraception. Um, or you'll, you'll hear us um, speak about the dignity of the human person, especially um, the unborn, which Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, Pope John Paul II before him, um, have all spoken about in a continuous way. Um, in the Mass, for example, if, as many of you have seen, um, often, uh, we'll have the entrance antiphon at the beginning of Mass as opposed to an entrance hymn. Uh, why do we do that? It's because, again, being in this, this hermeneutic, this line of continuity, when we have that entrance antiphon, it's a, usually a line from Scripture, um, and, and it puts us back in continuation with uh, the way that people experienced the Mass 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. And it also helps direct our hearts and minds to what the Church wants us to experience in that Mass. So as we're, we're processing forward, you'll hear the chant, which is a form of music which grows up and out of the liturgy. Um, chant is, is a type of music which is timeless. It, it doesn't have a time signature. And just as the Mass happens outside of time, chant helps bring us outside of time and, and it, it helps direct us towards something beautiful, something sacred, something awe-inspiring that's going on. 
Um, the same thing as you've seen me a few times celebrate Mass, what we call ad orientum, that is facing towards the east. Um, many people say, well, you know, the priest has his back to the people. Well, um, again, as I've said, it's, it's, it's not that, that I have my back to you per se, that is true, but it's that we're all going in the same direction. And again, the Second Vatican Council never said that we shouldn't celebrate Mass that way. In fact, it, it almost presumes that we do. And that brings us more in continuity with the way things were celebrated. A good analogy is everybody has family traditions, things that you've done for years and years and years. And, and of course, how ridiculous would it be um, to say, well, you know, this thing that we've done for 25, 30, 50, 75 years, uh, that's just ridiculous. We're just going to completely change that because everybody who did it before was wrong, right? There's this continuity with the past. How much more so when we're talking about the one subject church, that is the bride of Christ, the one who fell in love with Christ, that is passion, death, and resurrection, the one who was inflamed with love for him at Pentecost, the one who has preached Christ to the ends of the earth, um, that church into which you and I were baptized, that church through which we receive the sacraments, confession, marriage, anointing of the sick, and, and especially communion. And so all of that's to say, um, that all of this has come from the teachings of Pope Benedict, which were never new, but were always a new way of saying things. He had this beautiful, incredible way of distilling things down and with his incredible intellect, but also his, his power as a teacher uh, to be able to teach things that seemed very high and lofty in a simple way. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to share a little bit about what Pope Benedict has taught me and, and what I try to teach and pass on to you, not simply through words, but by some of the decisions that we make here in the Bi-County and some of the ways in which we celebrate, especially the liturgy. Uh, I ask all of you to pray for the repose of the soul of Pope Benedict the 16th and to remember him. Um, there are lots of great books that you can get um, written by him. Uh, he had a great series on the history of the church um, and then through the apostles and through the saints. Um, that was his Wednesday audiences and those have been published. They're really short. Um, you can order those. Uh, again, I recommend the Jesus of Nazareth uh, um, volumes. Uh, also his, his encyclicals, Deus Caritas Est, which is God is love, um, is a beautiful one. Um, and that's where we get that quote that Christianity is not the result of an ethical choice or lofty idea, but an encounter with a, a person. Um, and so he's got a lot of beautiful writings. And so I just invite you to delve deep into them. But most importantly, to think about how you've encountered Jesus Christ personally in and through the church. That is the bride of Christ, the one who loves Christ and who returns that love to him and has done so for centuries and centuries from our ancestors up to this point here in the Bi-County area where we are so blessed to be Catholic, we are so blessed to be disciples of Jesus Christ, and we are so blessed to have had popes like John Paul II, like Benedict, and now like Pope Francis. Thank you. God bless.